Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare. Did you know that if you're getting less than six hours of sleep a night, you could be at risk for some serious health problems such as high blood pressure, heart disease, or even weight gain? And what if that poor night's sleep is being caused by a sleep disorder? What can you do about it? What kind of treatments are there? How do you know if you have a sleep disorder? For some answers, we're very pleased to have with us from the Healthy Sleep Care Center and the St. Paul Lung Clinic, Dr. Andrew Steen. Thank you for being with us. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you for Appreciate having me. Appreciate it. And he is a pulmonary critical care sleep specialist. So you're the right person for the answers here. Yeah, it's, it's actually a very shared specialty. I'm one of many right people to help. But yeah. <laughs> so if you're asleep, how do you know if you have a sleep disorder? Um, well, one piece of advice is trust your spouse and trust your bed partner. Um, they obviously, uh, or very often have a lot of complaints about your sleep that you may not be aware of. Complaints like you snore so loud you're rattling the chandelier. I very rarely have a patient who complains about their own snoring. <laughs> <laughs> um, complaints also like you're not breathing well or you're choking yourself awake uh, from sleep um, are also common complaints or observations of a bed partner. Um, but when a person has a complaint about sleep, it usually isn't of the time they are asleep. It's usually the morning after and the day after. Uh, sensation of not feeling rested when you get out of bed. So you know what, I slept eight hours last night, but I don't really feel like I'm ready to get up and go. Um, a lot of people adapt to that. They have their pot of coffee in the morning or mm -hmm. they immediately engage their brain or I'm not good until I shower. We generate a lot of excuses for not feeling rested when we wake up and then if you just go about your day, often you don't realize how tired you really are. Some people do. They can fall asleep anytime, anywhere. It presents a real health hazard for them. I fall asleep driving. I'm falling asleep on the job. I come home from work, start turning on the news, and I'm out in my chair. Um, but oftentimes, it's a little bit more subtle than that. It's I'm a little bit forgetful. Um, I, I don't feel as sharp as I used to be. I just feel a bit run down. Um, I just don't feel like the person I think I should be. And so often it's subtle. So anywhere in that whole spectrum uh, might represent a sleep problem. So when is it a problem? I mean, uh, if you, let's say, last night I didn't get maybe as much sleep as I normally would, but is it accumulative? Is it over if you're constantly not, chronically not sleeping well? So, so both. I mean, we, we've all felt the acute sleep deprivation effect, you know, the all-nighter that we had in mm -hmm. school or just that fun social event that didn't let us sleep until the next morning. Um, and so there is an effect from both acute sleep deprivation and chronic sleep deprivation. Even just a couple nights back to back, you have performance issues on the job. Uh, we know test-taking ability declines like in school um, or other performances. Uh, there are uh, one fun one that we frequently will do is uh, mock driving. So you sit in a simulator and try to drive and, and you see as the kid runs out in front of the car, response times. And, and if your response time is diminished, that often is an effect, a cumulative effect of sleep deprivation. Right. And you can understand the public health hazard of something like that too. Now I understand there's a thing called a sleep study where you can actually go in and find out if you do have a sleep disorder. What is that exactly? Um, so there are many kinds of sleep studies. The, the one that when you say a sleep study that most often is brought to mind is something called a polysomnogram. Um, it, they are often performed uh, in a laboratory. Uh, Health East has a laboratory in Egan and a laboratory in Maplewood. These uh, laboratories look kind of like a five-star hotel. I've seen them. Yeah, no, they're they're yeah. very they, they back in the 80s, 90s. If you visited a sleep lab, it very hospital feel, but nowadays very hotel feel. I mean, everything short of the mint on a pillow. You get your own bed, your own chair, your own TV, uh, your own bathroom, um, and uh, when you check in uh, to the sleep lab. The first thing they frequently do is uh, put stickers on you, on the parts of your body they're going to measure while you sleep. Um, and there are lots of things that we measure, which is actually probably the worst part of the sleep study, is that you've got these stickers and wires coming off of them from all parts of your body. Um, How can you sleep with that? Yeah, it, for some it is quite difficult. Uh, typically I try to liken it to sleeping in a hotel. I mean, there's an alien environment. Most people just take longer to sleep in a hotel than they sleep at home. Plus, you're all stuck up with these stickers. Uh, in general, it takes someone about 10 minutes longer to fall asleep in a sleep lab than it does at home. Um, but usually, these are sleepy patients. So these are patients that generally don't have difficulty falling asleep. Uh, very often, we will prescribe, however, a sleeping pill so that if you've come to the sleep lab and really you've tried for an hour or two of falling asleep and you can't, then you take a sleeping pill and help yourself fall asleep.
So what's our, what are the types of things that you do measure? Um, we put several of these stickers on the scalp to monitor your brain waves. That helps us know if you're awake or if you're asleep, uh, how deep is your sleep, uh, stage of sleep, um, and how disturbed is your sleep, how many times is your brain being bothered by events uh, of all kinds. And that's what a lot of the other stickers are trying to help us identify is what are those kinds of disturbances. Uh, we put uh, a pair by your eyes to see if your eyes are open or closed and to see if you're in what we call rapid eye movement sleep. We put a cup on your heart to monitor your EKG, a couple on your legs to look for kicks and twitches while you sleep, um, a couple on your chin to monitor the general muscle tone of the upper airway, one on your neck to listen for snoring. I know it's kind of accumulating the number of stickers that you have on you. Um, we put a little plastic tube under your nose, kind of like the plastic tube that people with oxygen wear, um, except we're measuring breathing. Are you breathing? How deep is your breathing? How regular is your breathing? Uh, we'll put elastic belts around your chest and abdomen to see if you're trying to breathe. Uh, and then we put a little sensor on your finger that monitors your oxygen levels while you sleep and make sure that those are staying where they're supposed to be. And um, do you just do it a one-time thing? Does insurance cover it? In, yeah, insurance covers it uh, if there's an indication for it. I mean, you can't just walk in and want it, but if there's a reason to have it, they mm -hmm. cover it well. Um, the, uh, I forget the next question. Um, do you just do it one time? Do you oh, have right. to do it multiple nights or right. days? I don't even know. Is it daytime, nighttime kind it's of a sort of? your usual sleep schedule. We can okay. accommodate whatever it is. So if you're awake at night and sleep during the day, we can accommodate that sleep schedule. But typically most of us sleep at night, so the study is done at night. Um, for patients with obstructive sleep apnea, which is our most common diagnosis when we have a diagnosis that we make besides normal, um, is 70% of the time a single night study. We can do it all in one night. 30% um, of the time we can't get all the information we need in a single night. That doesn't often and doesn't usually mean we need a second study. It just means we're dealing with some missing pieces of information that clinically we kind of have to fill in the gaps. Um, there are occasions for people with very bad sleep apnea uh, or very hard to treat sleep apnea uh, or other um, more hidden diagnoses that often we need a second study for. And we've heard of sleep apnea. What exactly is it and how do you treat it then if once it is diagnosed? Um, when I, sleep apnea uh, comes in two main forms. The first is a disease that we call central sleep apnea, which is when a person just chooses, choose, involves volition, but when a brain doesn't generate the signal to breathe. So you're able to breathe, the brain just isn't saying don't. It's very dangerous. A, yeah, it is. Yeah. It, it, it is associated with some heart diseases like heart failure and some strokes where parts of the brain are damaged and just don't generate that signal. Um, the main disease that we mean when we say sleep apnea is a disease called obstructive sleep apnea, which is a disease where the person is trying to breathe at night, but for a variety of reasons, a narrow nose, a narrow throat, they are unable to breathe without effort. And since sleep is supposed to be an effortless thing, Whenever it's broken up by that effort, it starts breaking up sleep and causing consequences. And treatments for that? Um, a lot of treatments depend on the severity and the tolerance of the patient. The, the most typical therapy is something called uh, continuous positive airway pressure, or CPAP. And essentially, it is a pneumatic splint or an air pressure splint. So a mask that usually fits either in the nose, over the nose, or over the nose and mouth that uses air pressure to keep the throat open so that the throat's open. You're breathing on your own, it just keeps you open. Um, there are other treatments besides CPAP. There are several varieties of oral appliances, so mouth guards that pull the jaw forward, and by pulling the jaw forward, pull the tongue forward and open up the throat that way. Um, and then often we also recommend lifestyle modifications. A weight loss, for instance, of 30 pounds can cure some people with sleep apnea. Um, cigarette smoking. Uh, the smoke itself swells the throat, and if you just abstain from smoking, that Less swelling goes American. away and the throat can just open up because of that. Um, we often sometimes also recommend uh, position therapy, uh, which is uh, to avoid sleeping on your back. Um, when you're on your back, gravity is actually helping close the throat, and when you sleep on your stomach, it can actually help mm -hmm. hold the throat a bit more open. Um, the severity of your disease helps dictate therapy. So for a very severe disease, pretty much universally we're going to recommend CPAP as the first choice. For more milder forms, lifestyle modifications and oral appliances are great therapeutic options. What would be some other disorders? I think we hear a lot about insomnia. 
Insomnia is the other main one we get a lot of complaints about. Um, and insomnia is kind of a catch-all uh, catch term. Um, it can mean difficulty falling asleep, such that I'm lying in bed for an hour or two and I can't. Um, or it can mean difficulty maintaining sleep. So I don't feel like I have a problem falling asleep, but I'm waking up and staying awake for 20 minutes at a time through the course of the night. Um, and unfortunately, since it's such a broad thing, it's also a, a broad etiologies uh, that cause it. There are some people who are insomniacs their whole life. I just, I, ever since I was a child, it takes me an hour or two to fall asleep. Um, insomnia is a very common component of a grief reaction. You know, your spouse dies, and, and now you're so filled with the grieving process that you just can't fall asleep. Um, it very commonly accompanies um, some uh, medical disorders like depression or anxiety disorders mm. um, that, that you just have such dark thoughts or anxious thoughts that you spend so much time in your head you can't relax. Um, often it's a behavior issue um, and those are some of the simpler things to fix. You have coffee right before you go to bed, you're smoking right before you go to bed. Um, often it's confusional issues for the body. If, if you watch TV in bed, sometimes your body doesn't know, is the bed for sleep or is the bed where I watch TV? And then when you just rapidly transition from turning the TV off and you wonder why I can't fall asleep for 30 minutes. Um, and so there are a lot of things that contribute to insomnia. Final comments and advice for the viewers that might be watching? Um, the first bit of advice is trust your bed partner and spouse. If they think you have a problem, uh, don't ignore it. Just because you might feel fine, you might not appreciate how tired, irritable you might really be. So if they're concerned, bring that to the attention of your doctor. Uh, there may be a lot of things that we can do to help you feel better. Um, I, I was once taught when, you feel, when someone feels fine, it's hard to make them feel better. But I've had a lot of people that have told me they feel fine, and then when they start treatment for sleep apnea, praise me and say, I can't, I can't believe how much better my life is now. So I have a very low threshold uh, to bring any concerns to your doctor or to us. And the best way to contact you would be? Um, there is a healthy sleep care line. Um, you can uh, find your local sleep lab uh, and contact them, and they'll give you a number to get a hold of us. The best way often is just to go through your regular doctor, uh, your primary care provider, because often they have a preference of who you see and where you go to. All right. Well, thank you, Andrew Steen, Dr. Andrew Steen. It was great to have you with us. Always great a advice. Thank and you. Glad to hear about that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Still ahead, how about a little spring cleaning for yourself? We'll have some tips for you when we come back. Stay with us. I'm starving. What's for breakfast? Guten Tag! No, honey's wrong! I bring you arts enriched raisin blums, fortified with increased test scores and creative problem solving skills. It's good! And good for you. Bobby? Susie? Don't worry, that's just the power of the arts! <laughs> <laughs> Feed your kids the arts. For 10 simple ways to learn how, visit AmericansForTheArts.org. Four, three, two, one. Welcome back to Inside Healthcare. Joining us now is Beth Durkensane. She's a nutrition and fitness specialist with Woodwind's Waste Wellness Program. And Beth, it's that time of year. Lots of us are doing spring cleaning, cleaning out our houses, our garages, our, our office space. And you're here to talk about how we can help clean ourselves out. What would be some of those things and tips that you could Exactly. Have? Thanks so much for having me. Um, and, you know, it is that time of year. And we put so much effort and so much time into cleaning the other spaces in our life, but we, can, we kind of forget about ourselves a little bit. So we want to encourage people to take a look inside yourself and do you need a little dusting off or do you need a deep cleaning? And, you know, some of the tips that we like to pass along are just looking at what are you putting into your body. So many people um, kind of overlook that. We take better care of our cars sometimes than we do our own bodies. So, you know, what are you eating? Trying to cut out a few of those processed food items that we tend to rely on when we're short on time but need to get a meal on the table. And, you know, what helps people do that is shopping more around the perimeter of the grocery store and trying to minimize your time up and down the aisles. Um, another thing to really try to shoot for is more vegetables. Most of us don't get the vegetables in that we need, the vegetables and fruits. And so trying to eat in more of a clean way by trying to get more fresh produce, cooking more from scratch, minimizing all the processed foods. And water, of course, too, is a huge thing. You know, just trying to minimize all those sugary beverages and soda pops and caffeine that we're drinking 
and replacing it with water because water is the best cleanser you can get. So, and then, you know, trying to sneak a few organic items in there too. I always try to encourage people to maybe start gradual and bring in some organic dairy products and maybe then sneak in a few fresh organic vegetables and fruits. And, and why organic? Organic is just grown without the pesticides and it's really, you'll really taste the difference too. You're going to taste more of the fruit rather than the nasty stuff that they spray on top of the fruit when mm -hmm. it's not organic. So, and a lot of them are a little richer in vitamins and minerals too and just safer for our bodies. But yeah, like I said too, there are um, what we call the dirty dozen, which are the ones that you want to prioritize when you're doing organic. And what would those be? Some examples of those are going to be a lot of the berries, um, just because in like tomatoes, some of those items that are grown that where you're going to eat the skin, you're going to eat the seeds, where if you're eating an orange or a banana, you're going to be peeling that skin off. So that's not as necessary to do okay. more organic. So keeping that in mind too, but definitely pushing that water. A lot of us don't get enough of that in. So now, when you said shopping around on the at the grocery store, mm -hmm. what are you talking about on the perimeter and why there? Yep, trying to if you stick around the outside rim of the grocery store, you're that's where all your fresh produce, your fresh dairy products, all those items are going to be around the outside. It's when we sneak up and down those aisles is when we get into all the boxed items and the more frozen prepared items that have, they're just full of preservatives and additives and sodium, which aren't so good for us. So not that you have to do all your shopping around the outside, but the majority of it, that's where you should try to stick stick with that area. And back on the water, I, I think I always read that you should have eight glasses of water. I struggle to get eight glasses of water in mm -hmm. my day. What advice and how can you go about doing that? You know, I have people, you know, try to keep track of how much they've taken in and also just trying to make your water a little bit more exciting, take, taking like any kind of the fresh citrus fruits and squeezing the juice into it. Um, a lot of people try also to do like things like Crystal Light or Gatorades and things like that, and I really encourage them not to do that um, because of all, all the artificial sweeteners and then a lot of the sports drinks too have the high fructose corn syrup in them. So you really want to just stick with plain old water and like I said too, just trying to get some of the fresh, the fresh citrus fruit juice in there is going to make it a little bit more appealing. So trying that trick. You know, mentioning the corn fr fruit toast, um, I'm amazed at how many products have that in there when you start looking at the ingredients. And mm -hmm. why is that a good thing to stay away from or minimize that intake? Well, what studies have kind of shown are that, you know, the more sugar you take in, it's definitely, it increases your cravings for sugar later in the day. And, you know, we get so much of the refined sugar carbohydrates in our diet that it's just not a good place to go. It's, it's a cheap way for them to basically sweeten up everything. So that's why you see it so much. But I think they have drawn more attention to that now. And I always tell people, you know, go more natural. Just if you want to go sugar, just do the real thing, but less of it. And what about whole grains as far as trying to cleanse yourself? And, and mm -hmm. that would be another probably good advice? Yep. Um, fiber is our body's internal scrub brush. And so you definitely want to get the fiber in and make sure it's coming from all different sources of fiber. But you definitely want to do more of the 100% whole wheat than the whole grain because the 100% whole wheat is just going to give you even more nutrients. And along with increasing your fiber, always make sure again that you're getting enough water in because it can work, it can counterbalance each other if you're not getting enough hydration and you're doing a lot of fiber. So keep that in mind too. What would be some other ways to get that high fiber in your diet? Lots of fresh vegetables and fruits, um, nuts and seeds are also another good way. And then just trying to do all whole grain cereals and breads too. And there's so many to choose from out there. Mm -hmm. Usually people don't have the trouble getting them in. So Now, when I think of like cleansing, I mean, do you have to do like a, a cleansing period, like a fasting almost with, with um, I don't know, some kind of... Like a detox, detox diet? Detox kind of a diet, yeah. Yes, and that is kind of the latest fad. That's what you hear about are all these detox diets. But um, what the problem with those is that a lot of people, if you're used to just eating the normal American way, and then you go and you do a detox diet... You can run into some problems. Um, it can make you pretty ill, and it is not always going to be okay for everyone's body. So that's why, you know, I wouldn't say that that is necessary. I think just a couple small changes in your diet are going to get you what you need, and it's just going to be more practical for most people, too. 
And as a, a certified personal fitness trainer, too, I would think part of the spring cleaning would be getting up, getting out, doing something, mm -hmm. getting active again. We tend to hibernate here in Minnesota. Yes, exactly. Some of us are seasonal exercisers, so we try to discourage that. I think that's me. Mm -hmm. yeah. That can happen. We become a little bit more shut in during those winter months. Um, so we do. We tell people, you know, springtime is a great motivating factor to get yourself outside, get yourself outdoors, and get moving. The cardiovascular fitness needs to come with, you know, also the weight resistance training, too. Sometimes people will just do their walks, but they won't do any kind of weight-bearing exercise where they're using weights and working the muscles and building lean mass also. So we do want to encourage, in addition to doing the cardiovascular exercise, also doing some weight training about twice a week, and then don't forget about flexibility. You know, your stretching needs to come with that too. It's the part of fitness that gets ignored, but if you're skipping the flexibility, you're gonna be more prone to getting yourself injured too. So yoga is another great way to get in both the weight resistance and flexibility at the same time. Yeah, you could take a lesson from our pets. You notice they always do stretching every day, mm -hmm. the, the cats and the dogs and yep. things like that. What would be some other tips that you might have for our viewers? Um, the other things I like to mention to people are besides looking at what you're putting into your body, how much are you putting into your body? Um, we all know people who eat just the perfect diet, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, whole grains, but they just can't get that weight to come off. Well, sometimes we eat too much you know, and if you're eating too much, but they're all healthy calories, our body doesn't care if it's extra calories. It doesn't matter what form it's coming in. If you're taking in more than what you're burning, you're, you will have weight gain. So look at portion control. Really practice that um, because that definitely plays a huge factor in your wellness, too. Trying to spread that food out throughout the day, eating smaller, more frequent meals rather than two really large meals. That's going to help your metabolism, mm -hmm. too. Burden. Um, other advice? Other advice is, you know, just set some small goals for yourself. Never make changes in your lifestyle or in your health and wellness that you can't live with. And never go on a diet. I know it's funny, I'm a dietitian, and I tell people that don't go on a diet. Um, because, you know, short term, that's probably going to bring you success. But long term, where are you going to be? So only make changes you can live with, small gradual changes. Once you meet those goals, set another goal and just continue. It's all about the journey. It's not a destination with this, so it's ongoing. And you're actually having a special event coming up in the month of April. Why don't you tell us about that? Yes, on April 30th from 9 till noon, it's a Saturday at um, Woodwinds, we are going to be having our spring cleaning event, which is a new topic for this um, year. And it's going to be wonderful. We're going to have lots of information packed into those three hours. Uh, we're going to be talking about eating clean and green, some of the things I mentioned earlier you know, what are some simple ways that you can make a few changes in your diet to eat in more of a clean way? So that will be beneficial, and one of our um, nutrition and fitness specialists is going to be speaking on that. And then we're going to have a couple guest speakers. We're going to have uh, someone from our natural care center at Woodwinds Hospital. A certified massage therapist is going to talk about the detoxifying benefits of massage therapy which everyone, you know, we get those deep knots when you I know. I was just telling to... my husband I need to get a massage yeah. there. It's exactly. Been a while. Yep, that always feels good. So she's going to talk about the benefits of that. And then from an organic salon, we are going to have someone visiting us and kind of looking and reevaluating how you're using your beauty products and what are some ways that we can beautify ourselves without all the chemicals. You know, when you go and you get your hair colored or highlighted or you go and get a facial, Sometimes the things that they're using aren't always healthy for your body, so we're going to talk about that. And then last but not least, we're going to talk about what's lurking in your cleaning agents at home. You know, what are you exposing your family to and yourself to and the environment to? Um, how can we make changes and try to use more healthy, natural products that aren't going to harm anyone? seems like we have more choices than ever today with healthy mm -hmm. products and green products. Mm -hmm. um, so if someone's interested, I know um, space is, seating is limited. So how can they it is, sign up for it's it? It's limited, and that's what we really like to express because we like everyone to get in there. So if you can, um, you'll want to give us a call at 651-232-1926. And it's, um, we're running a special, too, where if you do register with a friend, it's $10 off the registration fee. So that would be a great thing to do with some girlfriends. 
um, but you definitely want to register as soon as possible because we always fill up really quickly with our events. So. And um, in our final couple of minutes, if they're not able to go to this event, but they're interested in more spring cleaning for themselves mm -hmm. or interested in some of the programs, can you tell us just a little bit about the Ways to Wellness and what kinds of things you do offer? I would love to. Um, at Ways to Wellness, I think what makes us so special and stand out from standing out from the crowd is that our experienced staff, we're all certified personal trainers and dietitians, which is a very unique combination. The other thing I love about our program is everyone that walks through the door is treated in a unique way. Everyone's got different needs to meet their wellness goals and you're, everyone's looked at as an individual. So, you know, we offer um, lots of different things. We have weight management programs for families as well as individuals. We have one-on-one -on -one personal training. We also have group fitness classes. And uh, we now also offer health and wellness coaching. We have a health and wellness coach on staff who's also a licensed pharmacist. And so that's been new for our program. And just recently, we've also added Pilates reformer machines, which is a specialty too, which we're able to offer our clients. And what exactly are those? They're awesome. They are um, basically, it, it almost looks like a bench with pulleys and all kinds of fun stuff on it. But what they're really meant for is just elongating the muscles and strengthening. So I like that. Yeah, yeah. a lot of toning without a lot of bulk. And they are really um, nice, too, for anyone post-rehab who's had a hip or a knee done. Anyone who maybe has limitations and doesn't want to necessarily go to the gym and bulk up with some heavy weights but wants to tone. And also the flexibility factor, too. Your flexibility will improve with the Pilates Reformer machine. So lots of good stuff. Out of time, quickly, if they want more information about Ways to Wellness, where can they go? Yes, if you want more information, you can visit our website, and that is at www.woodwinds.org slash ways to wellness, or become our friend on Facebook, and you'll learn all about all the new updates and things that we have going on and tips, too. All right. Well, thank you, Beth. This was great having you on. Thank you. Appreciate all the great advice and tips that you gave us today. Thanks. Thanks. And we'd like to thank you for joining us. And just very quickly, I want to thank Scott Jensen for producing our amazing new open. So a big thank you to him and thank you to you. Thanks for joining us. We hope we'll see you next time on Inside Healthcare. Inside Healthcare. For more information, visit stjohnshospital-mn.org or call 651-326-7800.